when you, you think about there's sort of these, these collisions of chaos, I guess you can kind of say right now, of this transition into sort of digital publishing combined with sort of this um, instructional, you know, delivery of instruction is kind of happening combined with how people are using spaces kind of differently. It's not just sort of the library that's changing, but sort of higher ed is kind of changing and, and it will kind of evolve with that. And welcome to educationfutures.com. I'm happy to be joined today by Brian Matthews, the Associate Dean of Learning and Outreach of Virginia Tech's University Libraries. Matthews is the author of the popular Ubiquitous Librarian blog, part of the Chronicle of Higher Education's blog network, and the 2009 book, Marketing Today's Academic Library, a bold new approach to communicating with students. Recently, Brian gained international attention for his work, Think Like a Startup, a white paper to inspire library entrepreneurialism intended to inspire transformative thinking in higher education using insights from startup culture and innovation methodology. Thank you for joining me, Brian. What motivated you to write Think Like a Startup? This question of how do you define a startup, and it's, you know, I kind of mentioned it in the paper, but that it's really an organization trying to do something new under conditions of extreme uncertainty, which, you know, I think if you, if you look at a lot of the higher ed literature right now, there's a lot of concern about not just libraries, but how higher ed is sort of evolving. We can learn from companies or organizations that are kind of doing that. Brian, I was hoping you could elaborate. Um, you have a really wonderful quote speaking about culture change uh, within academic libraries. You say, we can't hire a few creatives in improvisational individuals and expect them to deliver new service models if the work culture is not ready for the new service models. We can't expect entrepreneurialism to flourish in a tradition-obsessed environment. We can't just talk about change. It must be embedded in the actions of employees. Brian, as a leader, how do you work with your colleagues at Academic Libraries to help build this new creative and innovative culture? I'll make two comments on that. One is, you know, I've really been rediscovering, I guess, you know, the, the sort of Daniel Pink book, Drive. He really talks about this thing called functional fixedness, this sort of cognitive bias that we have that limits a person from using an object in only the way that it's traditionally used. And it gets in this bigger sort of problem of whether you're talking about human resources or you're thinking about the sort of identity of the library or you're thinking about, you know, the person who's the, the shelver or, or has a really finite role. We kind of put them into these sort of labels and or these nice sort of categories and say it's sort of this is your job and and sort of that's it where there might be sort of other sort of skills or opportunities and, and things they have that they're they're interested in and, and that the what we're kind of experimenting with is a thing we're right now we're calling it hubs so there's sort of four hubs that we're kind of looking at one is sort of like a, a learning common hub. one is sort of a an e-research digital scholarship kind of hub one of them is a sort of collection analysis collection management kind of hub so the, the hub that i'm going to be running is called sort of a new learning initiative and that's kind of connected to a, a, a campus-wide um, center that's emerging it's a center of innovation in learning which the library has a 25 percent stake in and it's getting back to your question about how do you kind of engage people we're we're we're, we're kind of you know we're not calling it the google 20 percent, but we're kind of exploring really the kind of that model where we'll kind of enable people to be able to devote a percentage of their time away from the sort of their core duties and kind of invest their sort of time into uh, one of these kind of four hubs and we kind of imagine it being sort of at least a one-year commitment so people can cycle through you know, and go to different hubs that they want, and and they can not be in a hub for a year or two, depending on what what they're doing. But it's still going to be sort of fleshed out and and, and developed, and and the types of projects and activities that they're doing. But but it's it's a way for people who who maybe don't traditionally get an opportunity to sort of volunteer or to kind of get involved to kind of be in, into something that's a little bit more of a it's very experimental, very sort of R and D focused, very different type of work. That's that's not really like a, a committee. You know, the way I'm treating my hub is it's really much kind of like a fellowship almost, where a community of practice where people come in. In. They'll have a, a projects that they're kind of doing independently, and then they might have projects they're doing collaboratively with, you know, maybe someone else from the library or from, you know, working with the the, the writing center or working with a, a faculty who's who's kind of out there trying something kind of new. So it's it's a, it's really a, a platform to get people experimenting outside of just um, the sort of learning that we kind of typically associate with sort of library instruction, information literacy, and that kind of thing. It's 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 um, it really kind of blows up that whole thing and, and looks more at the, the wider learning landscape. So it's, it's still kind of being put together, but I think it's, it's opportunities like that. I think another, another approach that I've seen that's been really successful, particularly at NC state, you know, making funds available for people to kind of pitch a project and, and, and like a micro grant or, or something like that. So that way, you know, someone has a, a concept that they want to do, then they're able to kind of make that happen. Again, you don't really think of the talents and, and um, interests that people have until you kind of, give them that canvas to kind of try some new things. And, you know, everyone's kind of talks about they want to be innovative and they want to be, you know, this and that. And it's, it's you know, how do you demonstrate that by allowing people to, to, to do that kind of thing is what we're, what we're kind of dabbling with. Excellent. 
Brian, as you know, one of the hottest topics right now are different ways in which colleges and universities are packaging their courses and making them available for students. Certainly one idea is is the MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course. It's interesting to think about students and their informational needs when they're engaging in Massive Open Online Courses. What opportunities are available for academic libraries? Big picture in terms of, you know, libraries, you know, I kind of see it, this is really a, a platform for us to kind of become and to demonstrate sort of ourselves as sort of like public thinkers or public makers, learners, teachers, that kind of thing, where if you think about it, you have this, this over 100,000 people in a class, and it's a great way for librarians or a team of librarians. So if you take something like ACRL's STS group, the Science and Technology section, you get 20 volunteers or something like that, where they kind of will, will join and participate in these, not necessarily to sort of play a traditional library role to like answer questions or, or, or do that, but really to kind of engage in that community. I think... It, it, it showcases here's a here's a librarian that's sort of you know side by side with you as sort of these these learners and then don't have to necessarily be learners at your school you're kind of really kind of doing that part of showing how the librarian can be there and can facilitate a sort of a, a referency role if, or instructional role if that happens to, to to surface but it's really about kind of becoming part of that sort of learning experience in, in in the broadest sense and I think it's you know we talk about how do we sort of demonstrate that sort of redefining of the library I think it's it's, it's things like that of like finding ways that we kind of connect to this sort of experience without having that wave that flag of like, I'm here as a librarian and this is, this is the sort of the, the, the suite of services that I can offer. I love the general concept about sort of networked learning and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and the, the self-paced. And, and when, you, when you read about this or hear people talking about it, there seem to be sort of two threads of that conversation. One side is this is going to replace higher ed as we know it. Everything's going to be delivered in this format. And then we're going to come down to like 10 or 20 universities in the world. And, and that's kind of it. And you know, I think the other side that's, that's probably a little bit more sort of realistic is how does this sort of supplement higher education? That's fascinating. Brian, recently faculty at several institutions, including Harvard, have voted in support of publishing in open access journals. What do you think the future is for open access journals and academic publishing in general? I think the really the, the bigger driver than, than these elite universities is kind of what happens with the, the, the government the Fed, where if you're, you know, the whole thing about grant, federal grant money being used for publications and, and making those publications available to the to the public, I think that's kind of a stronger thing. Where if, if a lot of those institutes and, and, and granting agencies kind of in, in, insist on that, then um, I think that OA has kind of a, a better chance of, of of seeing that happen. Brian, as you know, decreasing support of higher education has really threatened the collections of academic libraries. There's a real fear that in the future. A lot of institutions will be priced out of essential academic databases and journals. Do you think there's an opportunity for a new service or product to enter the market, something like a Spotify or iTunes for academic research? Well, depends on who you are, but I think that's the sort of hope, you know, a little bit that that kind of comes along because that way you kind of, you, you know, you pay by that drink or, you know, instead of buying this journal, I just need that article or this chapter or something like that. I've been seeing a lot more kind of in, in, in like, Fast Company and, and Wired and things like that about the, the data. And and I kind of feel you know, everyone wants to kind of manage your data and everything like that. And that's what I kind of wonder too about libraries in terms of, you know, we can kind of do it, but we're kind of a, you know, a small operation compared to like an Amazon or something like that where like they're kind of deal with big data. And so I, I, I worry a little bit that we kind of might miss out on that sort of opportunity a little bit to kind of be like a, a data management kind of thing where if, if, if someone kind of comes forward with a, a very inexpensive and, and sort of scalable kind of thing like that, there goes the data, you know. So I don't know. I don't know if it's lucrative. That's the kind of problem is, is sort of, you know, the iTunes approach is, you know, it works for like music and it works for film and it works for sort of popular novels and things like that. But how does it how does it work in that sort of scholarly communication world? Brian, your Think Like a Startup white paper reminded me of one of ARL scenarios on research entrepreneurs. This scenario describes how in the future, librarians and researchers will not work in traditional contexts at academic institutions or within disciplines, but rather will chase short and long-term contracts with public and private businesses and nonprofit institutions. I'm wondering, how do you think your work relates to this idea of research entrepreneurs? I see the potential of that. When I read that scenario, I see it where sort of researchers become not necessarily like individuals, but you kind of have like teams, kind of like an architectural firm or a design firm or something like that. And so you have a you know, librarian like skills that are sort of involved with that. And just like you'd have, like, you know, if you're applying for a grant to do something with, 
cancer or these, you know, cell work or something like that. You kind of frame that where, oh, we have someone that does, does design. We have the information, informatics kind of piece. We have this person who's going to curate all our data and this kind of thing. So that that's kind of how I see it. If, if we take that scenario sort of really literally, I kind of see, you know, library and skills, the research to the sort of presentation, to the curation, to the to the archiving, you know, those sort of more, you know, traditional roles, but but being packaged in sort of a, a design firm or an art, uh, um, a research firm. So, you know, I don't know that, that that's going to um, employ everybody right now. I mean, because I think, again, that that becomes more of you come, have really competitive teams rather than a lot of sort of overlap in terms of like every university is applying for, for these same grants. I think it becomes much a much smaller sort of class, like you said, of, of sort of researchers. A lot of your work in research and presentations has focused on creating innovative cultures within libraries. Brian, as someone who is a leader and a practitioner, do you view that work as optional? Do you think that cultural change is really essential for the future of academic libraries? You know, what I you know talk a lot about, what I'm a big believer in, is sort of this user-sensitive philosophy. And that's kind of grown over time. And, and I think really the, the kind of best way to, I guess, maybe articulate that is, is thinking about um, this question like this. How do we get more people to use the reference desk? Because obviously, if they're using the reference desk, we're helping them and they're succeeding more in their assignments. Rather than the bigger question of like, how do we help people succeed in their assignments and not worry about that reference desk kind of thing? It's, you're, you're focused more on sort of that, that, that process that they're having. So the user sensitive thing, you know, and, and finding these inputs is, is really kind of involved with how do we, at one level, how do we kind of involve our users in our sort of brainstorming and building and, and, and follow up process. But the other one is, you know, how do we attack this problem or these kind of these situations or themes that we want to explore, kind of understanding um, their needs separate from maybe what the library provides. An example of this I can I can kind of give you is when I was in Santa Barbara, you know, I, I was able to hire a grad student. We kind of did this study together. We went and interviewed, I think it was about 47 graduate students. And, and our focus wasn't was kind of getting into their lab, whether that lab is a theater space or it's a sort of chemistry lab or it's a computer lab. And really kind of looking at sort of just their environment and, and having them show us the work they do. And it was really, you know, there was like one little question in there where we asked about their library use, but the whole intention wasn't to, for them to tell us about the library. I mean, that kind of came up, but it's really more about that process. And we really looked at that, that concept from, from student to scholar, that process from when I start my graduate program to when I defend my, my dissertation, what are sort of all those kind of steps? What are the sort of frustration points? What are the sort of blockages? You know, what are the sort of triumphs? How do you become part of a research? I mean, there's just, it's a whole immense kind of Kind of thing, but you know, when you're kind of looking at how do you kind of open yourself up to these different inputs, it's 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 approaching it like that. So a, a project that we've we're wrapping up here right now at, at Virginia Tech is is a thing called Discovery Teams, which was loosely based on a, a concept uh, from IDEO design firm Paul Alto. And what we kind of did is we we gathered a, a bunch of volunteers, about 47, 48 of them, that were consisted of librarians, library staff, some faculty, students, and also some some campus support agencies, kind of like the writing center and, and, and folks like that, advisors, and had them sort of put paired together into to teams of four, teams of five. And each of them had a different theme or some, there was some overlap, but, but themes such as uh, group collaboration, individual study, uh, media production, knowledge production, technology, mobile technology, things like that. And they kind of had a month to kind of go around. They would sort of do some interviews. It's kind of stock interviews, but they would also go around and um, just kind of make a lot of observations and really kind of become not necessarily experts, but but kind of delve into a little bit of that theme and how it applies to our campus. And about half of the time was supposed to be spent sort of in the library and in library environments. And the other half was non-library environments. So whether it's in, you know, a Starbucks or or most of them went to sort of other types of sort of learning spaces around campus and dorms and, and labs and that kind of thing. So, you know, and then they kind of had a, a standard sort of report that was in PowerPoint, so that's very easy to share. And then there's a series of workshops that we're kind of doing out of that. But it, it really kind of helped us to kind of understand a little bit for, for innovations and services and this kind of thing, sort of this this reality of students. And what we're trying to, to really kind of get at is as close as we can to sort of that learning process. Rather than just libraries provide this niche role of being – we help you find that article you need for that paper, really understanding not just how do I attack that paper from beginning to end, but beyond that writing of that paper, there's this composition of, of, of a design element, or there's this sort of video that I'm doing, or there's this data set that I'm like, you know, or a richer, or the goal was to kind of give our organization a sort of richer understanding of the types of work that students are, are, are doing. And then, so we're packaging that up over the summer and we're going to kind of push that back out in the, in the fall to probably like our student government and some faculty senate, you know, make some presentations on observations and this kind of thing and kind of build from there. But it's, it's really kind of for trying to get us closer or refreshing our sort of 
minds, if you will, about the, the type of work that students are doing. And then it kind of allows us to sort of position ourselves of, you know, there are opportunities, missed opportunities or, or, or partnerships or new partnerships, that kind of thing of how we can kind of um, team up. So it's, it's that kind of approach of not just kind of saying, how do we make the reference desk more successful? How do we kind of get more people in the library? Or how do we get people using our eBooks? Or I mean, that's, that's a different kind of framework. What, you know, what I'm more interested in is, is getting close to the process. Brian, I'm interested in the idea of power. In your white paper, you advocate for people to create new partnerships outside of the library. When you think about startup culture or creating these new hubs, as you described at your campus, do you think this really changes the dynamics of how your colleagues work across the institution? I mean, I think it gives them more opportunity to sort of interact with people at different levels. Um, I think there's there's still sort of our, our formal kind of college liaison, college, we kind of call them college librarians here, but there's that sort of um, departmental liaisonships that'll kind of happen. And there's certain relationships that are there. But when we think about it sort of administratively, you know, there's there's a lot of things that are kind of thrown at, at us and that, that I've kind of, I'll have someone kind of approach me and say, you know, I'd really like to kind of put a program together that involves one department and another department. They don't kind of call it that, but there's kind of like, you know, we'd like to kind of host an event. We'd also like to have an instructional component and then, oh, we'd like to archive it as well. So there's sort of three different kind of units that kind of come to that from the top perspective, you know, what I'm kind of looking at is how do we sort of connect these dots? You know, we kind of talk a lot about sort of mapping the library to, to teaching and learning and research. And so that's kind of how I see it as we kind of can sort of get doors open for the library and, and get doors open for the librarians. And then they can kind of have these these types of relationships for it. So that's kind of the thing we're kind of pushing to is how do we kind of um, maybe kind of stamp this brand as, you know, the library is about partnerships, you know, in the largest, vaguest sense possible and, and so then how do we kind of prove that? How do we show how we're partnering in sort of academic ways or student support ways or, you know, cultural ways, you know, these, these different threads that you kind of look at, but sort of partnership is, is kind of a, a framework that we kind of work in. So it's, 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 it's really kind of looking at that cultural thing of, of how do we kind of enable people that, that are, are forthcoming with ideas to, to really kind of accelerate. You mentioned in your white paper that people's understanding of the library is changing so much that, in fact, the name library might be a hurdle to its progress. Do you think in the future the modern academic library will need a new name? I think we definitely want to keep the keep the name and then we just kind of it'll it'll slowly kind of evolve. I think when you you think about there's sort of these these collisions of chaos, I guess you can kind of say right now of this transition into sort of digital publishing combined with sort of this how um, instructional, you know, delivery of instruction is kind of happening along combined with how people are using spaces kind of differently where there's, there's, it's, it's not just sort of the library that's changing, but sort of higher ed is kind of changing and, and it will kind of evolve with that. That's a great point. In the future, what skills will be important for academic librarians? I think I've read about it somewhere in ARL, but you kind of hear this, this sort of metaphor in, in different times. When we talk about the future of libraries, there seem to be two, and there's never just two, but, but two distinct realities. One is sort of the, the desert, and the other is the oasis, where there's dried up sort of libraries becoming sort of useless, if we will, in, in sort of a in, a in a traditional sense of not being used as much as they, they could be. Or they have these oasis or these places that evolve into being these, these very rich very in sort of engaging, I'll say environments, but it could be a virtual environment. It doesn't mean it has to be a physical environment as well. So I think there's going to be this this sort of path that's sort of evolving in terms of, of how we're moving. But I think, you know, part of it is too, is like we don't just sort of wake up in 10 years and be like, damn, we should have hired more programmers. But it's kind of like that, um, you know, if we kind of plant that flag right now, we kind of say, okay, digital curation is kind of a, a major theme of ours. And then, you know, as people sort of you know, retire or move on or something like that, you kind of rethink that position or you cobble together two other positions. And, and you know, I think a, a general trend we kind of see is, you know, how does sort of your, how does tech services evolve to being more about sort of metadata rather than about sort of cataloging? Where if we can, you know, if there's things that we can kind of purchase from sort of vendors or, or, you know, ways that we can kind of streamline, you know, some of those kind of backroom channel kind of works and then kind of move those people who have sort of those skills to kind of doing things with sort of local content or, or, or things like that. But yeah, I think it's kind of a thing you, with that sort of that strategic planning that kind of comes back to as you kind of say, you know, here's where we kind of, you know, we really want to grow in this area over the next five years. And then you kind of look for those opportunities to, to kind of reposition positions or, you know, that kind of thing. Brian Matthews, thank you so much for speaking with me. For more information on Brian's work and a link to his Ubiquitous Librarian blog, as well as his white paper, Think Like a Startup, please visit educationfutures.com.